Was this thing on? There it is. Hey, good morning. Let's stand together to worship the Lord this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry the kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I. say it again. You're going to say he is risen indeed. All right. We're ready this time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Way better. We're going to do this one more time. Let's blow the roof off this place. He is risen. He is risen indeed. 
Oh, what an awesome invitation we have this morning to celebrate the empty tomb, our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad you are here to worship with us this morning. I am Pastor John, and I'm going to invite you to be seated, okay? We have, I'm so excited about how we've been doing this Easter season. Monday, Thursday, we got to partake and participate in the, in the Monday, Thursday service as we came before the table of the Lord in Holy Communion, and we participated in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. On Good Friday, we participated in the crucifixion as at the end of the service, we ended and we came forward and we nailed our sins to the cross in a reflective but also a participating manner because it was our sins that held him there. And this morning we participate in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus as, as we see and we celebrate the empty tomb, our king on his throne in heaven, and we're gonna be inviting you forward in just a moment. We're gonna be singing praises. So as, as you come up, we're gonna be putting flowers into this cross. We are gonna bring this cross, this symbol of death and destruction that we see as the hope of our salvation. We're gonna fill this with flowers and joy and life as we look to the resurrected King who hung on it for you and for me. And Conan and the worship team are gonna be leading us in worship. And so as you come up, take probably say three to four flowers. We're filling up, so three to four flowers should be good. We're gonna fill this. If you're tall, if you're tall, get way up here, please. Because the kids, the kids fill this really well. The kids fill this really well. So work on filling the top. And uh, if you see empty spots, we're going to stick those in there. We invite you to head back to your chairs after you've gotten a chance to put some flowers in and to stand and to worship with us as we call on the name of Jesus and we proclaim his victory over the grave. Would you stand and sing? And I'm going to invite you forward to come and place flowers upon this cross this morning, participating in our resurrected Lord and Jesus Christ.
celebrate, Jesus celebrate, celebrate, Jesus celebrate, come on, celebrate, Jesus celebrate, one more time, celebrate, Jesus celebrate, let's give some praise to God, guys.
some praise this morning church isn't this cross beautiful isn't this cross beautiful this cross that stood for death and condemnation now stands for life that is our Lord Jesus Christ let's continue to worship
Lord, now thy Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain.
beat me to it. I was going to say, if that is your victory belief statement of faith this morning, that Jesus Christ has done this for you, can I get another amen? What an awesome promise that we get to celebrate today and each and every day. You may take a seat. It is awesome to be together with you in the presence of the Lord this morning, celebrating the empty tomb and the hope and the promise that we have in our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm trying to be better with my microphone etiquette for everybody else so you can hear me. I know, I've been called out a few times. It's okay. As, as we come and we worship together, it is so great to be in the fullness of the body as, as we gather and, and the invitation that we have to reflect on the promises and the gifts that God has given us so richly, especially in his son, Jesus Christ. But as we, as we gather and as we worship together, we have the invitation to, to bring tithes and offerings before the Lord and to celebrate what it is that he has done celebrating his presence and his faithfulness in our lives in the midst of, of the good and the bad and the, and the difficult and the painful, but also the joy. And he invites us to respond to what he is doing through our offerings and our tithes. And, and if you're a visitor here to, to Victory, I'm so glad you're here to worship with us. If you are family and came with family or friends, we're so grateful that they brought you this morning. But we want to invite you to soak in what God is doing. You know, it's Easter Sunday. We pray that you encounter the living God here this morning with us. But if you're, if you're looking for a church home, we're so glad you're here, and we invite you to just participate. There is no expectation. This is, this is what God calls his family to do. If he's placing that on your heart, great. But uh, this is as we reflect on the gifts that God has given us. We have a few different ways for you to give. We have a basket in the narthex that you can place uh, tithes and offerings. QR code online. It's on our website. It's on our church center app. You can go there as well. But would you pray with me as we, as we gather this morning's offering? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we rejoice in the finished work of your son Jesus Christ given for us on the cross as he was laid in that tomb and now we look on and we look back and we see that it is empty, that he is no longer dead, that he has been risen to new life and he is seated on his throne in heaven. God, we thank you for the promise that in his resurrection and through faith you call us to new life as well. We thank you for this promise of eternal life and salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, and we give you thanks. Lord, as we reflect on the ways that you have been faithful in our lives, we come before you with our, with our tithes and our offerings this morning. We pray that these would come from grateful hearts for what it is that you are doing and your faithfulness in our lives. And Lord, as, as we bring these before you this morning, God, I pray that you would, you would receive these, that you would bless these, that you would multiply these gifts so that the work that you've called us to as your church here at Victory, to, to, to the community of Jamestown, to the ends of the earth, that you would multiply this so that your word may go out. This hope of the Easter promise could be made known. And we give this to you for all glory and praise in your name. Amen. As we dismiss for the offering, we, we also invite you to greet one another. It's Easter Sunday, so saying he is risen or happy Easter are good things. If you've got uh, a sniffle or something that shouldn't be shared, we'll share the Easter peace this morning. Let's not share the colds and the coughs and all that stuff. So if you need to, to wave a little fist bump or, or elbow, we invite you to do that. But, but would you stand and greet one another in the name of an amazing father here this morning?
To cut this off. We've got so much to celebrate here this morning, don't we? I'm going to invite you to come back in and find your seats. I'm going to invite you guys back in to find your seats here this morning. As, as we prepare and I get to invite Pastor Sean up to share this morning's message, uh, we've got an awesome crew ready for King's Kids this morning. Miss Kristen, who is my wife, if any of you have not met her, she's going to be so embarrassed and hate me for calling her out. I'm sorry. My wife Kristen and Miss Sarah Ratz, they're going to be taking the kids down for King Kids. So if you have a pre-K through second grader, we invite you to go down for an awesome uh, kids message here this morning. And parents, I promise we'll bring them back at the end of the service for you during that last and final song. So if you King's kids... Pre-K through second grade, I invite you to come on up and head on down to, to the back and over to the fellowship hall for an amazing time and of worship. Pastor Sean, the floor is yours. This is beautiful, amen. 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 For 30 minutes after this worship service, everything will be moved to the side, and this cross will be here for you and your family to take pictures, grab your cell phones, come on up. Now, I give this little teaching every year for the, for the taller men, because uh, usually here's what the guys do. How's that look, you know? And, uh, and so, hey, guys, if your knees are sore, stand out in the end and let your wife and then the little kids could take a knee. You know, we could see the whole cross. Or, guys, it looks kind of cool if you're here, your wife is here, and the kids are on the other side. Use your imagination, but, you know, people want to see the whole cross. This is for you. Now, after everyone's done, it usually takes about a half hour. We've had crowds this size before. After about a half hour, what we want is... These flowers are either going to go home and they're going to sit on your table or they're going to go into a garbage can. Which one would you prefer, table or garbage can? <laughs> Let's go table. We, want, we got flowers for everybody in this, in this sanctuary. Don't go home without taking a bouquet of flowers so that we don't have to throw them. Fair enough? Say amen if you're with me. Amen. All right. So after the service, make sure you and your family come on up here and get a picture it's so, so awesome. Well, this is the one sermon that every pastor in America looks forward to every year because this day is what makes you and I Christian. It's all about resurrection. And this day is why we come and worship on Sundays, for example, because on Sundays is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And this day is the day that we talk about the good news of what he has done to set us free. Today, as we take a look at this text, and it's a text that I have preached so many times on Easter, but I want to give a new look, a fresh look. I want to spin things in a way that's going to make your mind say, wow, I've never thought of it that way before. This morning, I'm entitling the message, The Re-creation story. And 
I'm going to build my case as to why I'm calling it the RE slash creation instead of just the creation story. I want to build my case because I think we have a strong case in naming it the recreation story as we take a look back, all the way back in the book of Genesis and do some parallels to what's going on in the book of John. Now, in John chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, I want to set the stage, pop it up if you will, Faye. We're going to see in reading in Jesus' name what's happening in the text, and then I'll pray after I read. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your holy house on the most precious day of the year for Christians all over the world. And we invite you by the power of the Holy Ghost to come down through this word and through this message. Lord, use my voice to speak not what man would say, but what God would say. May you use, Lord, you spoke through a donkey. You could speak through me. And may you speak into the hearts of every person in this sanctuary an Easter message that would be unbelievably life-changing for every person. Whether they've been walking with the Lord for 50, 60 years, or maybe they're going to come to know you today for the very first time. Lord, set the stage, and may we leave this place knowing that we have just stood on holy ground. And all God's people said. And so, there in John 20, 1 and 2, and we're going to work our way through the entire text here today, I want us to take a look at the empty tomb story in John's gospel because it begins in darkness. Mary Magdalene is going to the tomb while it is still dark. Look at verse 1. Mary arrives at the tomb, and what happens when she gets to the tomb is Mary is literally jolted in her spirit. She can't believe it. She sees something has happened that is unbelievable. With fear, when she finds that the the tomb is is empty, that the body has been stolen uh, or removed in some way from from the tomb, she runs off to find Peter. And the other disciples, the one who Jesus loved, it says in verse 2. And she frantically tells them that someone has taken the body of Jesus, and I don't know where they have put him. This sets the stage. A very important setting for the narrative that I'm going to pitch to you. I want to convince you that this day is about a recreation story. Say, well, what do you mean, Pastor Sean? Well, I'm, what I mean is this. Every single one of us have had thoughts in our minds, days in our lives, things that we have said or done in the midst of a family or a, a situation at work where we say, oh, if I could only take it back. If I, could, if I could only rewind the clock, I never would have done this. God on this day, 2,000 years ago, gives us the opportunity through his son to rewind the clock and literally experience a, 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 a rewind, a recreation opportunity so that we can have a hope in something that's far beyond the bondage that we walk in day in and day out here. And so in John chapter 3, 20, verse 3 through 10, we see the story continue to unfold. Listen as I continue to read in Jesus' name. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went right into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head, The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, he went right inside and he saw and he believed. They still did not understand from Scripture what Jesus had 
that Jesus had risen from the dead. Let me go back and read that again. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciple went back to their, the disciples went back to their home. Verse 10. Peter and the other disciples are alarmed at Mary's report. They're concerned. All they know is that this, the stone had been uh, removed, it was rolled away, and they know for sure, based on what they're hearing, the body's gone. They both get up, they run to the tomb. The unnamed disciple, probably John, arrives there first, bending over, peering into the tomb. He sees nothing but the strips of linen. Then we see in the story, Peter catches up, he goes straight in, and Jesus' body, of course, Jesus Peter sees, is gone. Only the strips of clothes and the, and the head wrapping is there folded up. His body had been in the tomb now for two days. And I'm, just, I'm sitting there thinking, as Peter and, and pro, most likely the other disciple, John, they're standing there, what's going through their mind? Well, what would be going through my mind? I'm, I'm probably sitting there thinking to myself, did these bandits, did, did, would, did they remove these clothes, the clothing off of Jesus' body? And, and then why would they fold up the head napkin? This doesn't make any sense. But it gets even crazier when we look at verse 8, and it says, he saw and believed. What did he see? What did he believe? Let's continue on in the story. Look at verse, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Pause. Underline that word. That crying, Mary's crying there, that's significant in this story. We're going to come back to that. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated at Jesus' where Jesus' body had been laid, one at his head and one at his feet. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away the Lord, she said, and I do not know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned towards him, and when she realized it was he, she cried out in a loud voice in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went into the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that she had, that she told him that he had said these things to her. Now, I want to pull out a canvas and paint for you a beautiful picture of the things that are, are going to emerge as we start to think about our own life, the mistakes and struggles, the hurts, the fears, the worries, whether you've been a Christian for 60 years or you're just coming to know him for the very first time, I want us to imagine as we think back, as John is showing us how Jesus' resurrection is the re-creation story. He's giving us some hints that point back to the beginning of the gospel and to the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. How does Genesis, Genesis open in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? It opens by saying, in the... And then in the book of John, John chapter 1, verse 1, John opens the gospel, and he opens the gospel with, in the... Interesting. Where does Genesis, or, or what does Genesis say about the earth? Well, it says about the earth, darkness was over the face of the deep in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. How does the story open here in 
John chapter 20. It says in verse 1, while it was still dark, Mary went to the tomb. So we have darkness in Genesis. We have darkness in John. And where is Mary standing? Well, where is the tomb located? It's located in a garden. And where does the account of Adam and Eve take place? It takes place in a garden. You guys are getting quick. The story of Adam and Eve is one that begins with life, but because of sin, it ends in death. It ends in death. Our death. That's what sin brought on all mankind. It brought death. Now, the story of this garden, it begins with death, but because of the goodness of God, it ends with life. It's unbelievable. You see, Jesus shows us on resurrection morning, the resurrection of Jesus is there to reverse the curse that started in Genesis chapter 1. What a beautiful picture. In fact, as it reverses the curse, it helps us to recreate the world by knowing that God is entering into our lives on, on the resurrection day to recreate, to reimagine, to believe the unbelievable, that the stupid, unbelievable, sinful things that we have done, said, thought, acted, they have been removed, gone, like they never existed. God takes them away. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is a beautiful picture of how God's people can start living in a world where they believe that the curse that once used to rest on them has been pulled away. And what did God do after he removed Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden? Well, he put an angel right in front of the entrance with flaming swords, two angels right in front of the garden. And what does God do at the garden of the tomb when Mary peers in and she looks at Jesus' head and his feet? Who's sitting there but... Two angels. Now, Tony, I don't know if these are the two angels that were back at the Garden of Eden. I don't know. But one has to wonder. God's got a lot of angels. I mean, there's probably a few of them saying, me, 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 I want to do this one. But we know that there were a lot of things between the book of Genesis and the book of John that are paralleling. Back to the story. Now, Jesus, who was mistaken as the gardener with Mary, he asks Mary, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And for the third time, Mary states to Jesus, sir, uh, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him so that I can go get him in verse 15. And Jesus speaks to her in verse 16, and he says, Miriam. I just want to pause there for a second. I've tried to imagine, you know, I was raised by my grandpa and my grandmother, and I know their name, I, I know their voice. Like I, I heard it from the time I was a baby all the way through. They raised me till I graduated from high school. It's like your mom and dad. Now, they've been gone for many years, the early 90s. Some of you have had parents that have been that, that have died and gone on. Far longer than that. Maybe in the 60s or 70s or maybe even the 50s. I don't know. But there's something distinct about, an, uh, about a person's voice. And I know like at times I've had dreams or, you know, I might be in a different place, even a different part of the world. And I'm walking around and I hear someone's voice and it's like I whip around. I'm like, wow, I thought I heard my grandpa's voice. You ever, done, you ever been there before? You ever had that happen? That's kind of weird. But there's, there's kind of an identity with the vocal tones of one person's voice. And the reason why that is is because that voice that raised you all the way through, that was the voice who loved you and nurtured you, disciplined you, but was there unconditionally loving you. And that voice knows you. They know all about you. And you love that person. You love their voice. 
that it brings peace and comfort. And when Jesus says, Mary, she instantly, instantly recognized the risen Lord, her teacher, her friend, her savior. It's a wonderful thing how Jesus called her by name. He knows her. He sees her. Peter and John, what do they do? They walk away without acknowledging her pain. They just turn around and just walk out. And she's standing. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I don't know what went wrong. Watch out, Mary. I don't know. I mean, where'd he go? They didn't even pause. Just walked right by. But Jesus, Jesus sees her. He sees her and he loves her and he calls her by name. Jesus called Lazarus by name too, by the way. He'd been dead for four days, placed in the tomb, and Jesus had them roll away the stone and then he shouted into the tomb, Lazarus, come out! In John chapter 11, verse 43. And he comes out of the tomb. He comes out of his prison of darkness and he now enters into life. I want you to know that Jesus, Jesus sees you right now. Jesus sees you. He knows you and he loves you. He sees you as you really are. No in between, no facades, no, no, like he sees everything. He doesn't let any pretense stand in the way of who you are. He sees you as you really are, and that is not as you pretend to be. He doesn't pay attention to your social media posts. He doesn't pay attention to the veneer that we wear around as we get around in the community, as we, as we speak to others, protecting ourselves, because we truly do not want to be seen what's on the inside. We want to look different than who we really are, but he sees you, and he loves you exactly the way you are. Drink that in. He sees your hurts. He sees your disappointments. He sees your resentments. He sees your hopes, your dreams. He, he sees your desires. He sees your heart. He sees you, and he loves you anyway. Mary gets so excited when she recognizes that she has been seen by the Savior, she shouts out, Rabboni, which means teacher in verse 16. Now, what does he tell her to do? He says, go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary went to the disciples, verse 18, and she says, I have seen the Lord Interesting. The first garden story ends with them being sent because of sin and death. The second garden story, it ends with them being sent because of forgiveness and life. Which brings me to point one. The resurrection is the beginning of the recreation story. Let me say that again, because I want you to really get this. This is very important. To get point two, you got to get point one. Here's point one. Let me say it again. The resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of recreation. Jesus says in Revelation 21.5, I am making everything new. One of the problems that we struggle with in our world in our life, is, is that we hang on to things even after we confess our sin and call upon the name of Jesus, even though we try to let them go, they don't seem to just drop off. They don't seem to, 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 to disappear like, you know, you hear it from the pulpit. You, you, you look in the mirror and the, the old sin comes knocking and you feel so bad and you, you just don't know what to do. And, and the scriptures say in Revelation 24, 21 verse 5, Jesus says, I am making everything new. By everything, what Jesus means is I'm making 
you knew so that you don't have to look at the old you and feel bad about the things, but you can look at the new you through the eyes and the lens of Christ and know that because of his resurrection, because of his resurrection life and power available to you, he wants you to know it's all yours. Do you want it? Do you? You see, Jesus' gospel says in the book of John, God did not, John chapter 3, verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but say it with me, save. That's why he came. God does not want to condemn you. God has no animosity towards you. Zero. He loves you. He has reconciled you to himself because of Jesus' death on the cross. All you need to do is repent of your sins and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior so that you can be reconciled to him. It's about the recreation story, the story that you've been stuck in for 20, 30, 60, 70 years, feeling just the weight and the sorrow and the sadness, never really being set free. God says that when you are free, you are free indeed. A newness has come. God's gospel gives you the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Christ, it's when you can think back to this day when you heard the gospel in a whole new way and you said, could it be that he is recreating my life so that I can walk out of this church and not have to feel the weight, the guilt, and the shame any longer? Could it be that, that Jesus' resurrection will be the turning point in my history when God in Christ began a recreation story for me to give me a whole new view of the world, of my relationship with my family, my friends, my enemies, and everyone I know. Could this be the beginning of something new? And he, he says in Revelation 21 verse 4, every single pain you've ever experienced, every heartache, disappointment, every tear that you've shed, he says that he is going to heal it all. Listen to this. It says that he is going to wipe every, not some, not just the really heartfelt tears. No, no. He's going to wipe every tear from their eye. And there will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the old order of things is now passing or passing away. Which brings me to second, my second point. What seems to be passing away? Well, point two, death has been defeated. In fact, as we look at the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead means that he has overcome death. Jesus had to endure death. He had to go through it and experience it in order to overcome it. Whose death? His death, but whose death? My death and your death. There was no going around it or avoiding it. He had to go through it. He, he, he took it upon himself. He was there in the garden. He was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But God knew, he knew that it was a directive from God for Christ to go and suffer so that he could take away our, our second death. He endured it. He overcame it. And that means death itself has been defeated while we go through this life. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says this, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death has come through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes through a man. For in Adam all die, so that, say this with me, so that in Christ all will be made isn't that beautiful? You see, since death has been defeated, we no longer live in the fear of it. It's amazing. As we, as we drink in the promises, Hebrews chapter 2, 14 says, by his death, we might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all of their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death, I'm going to just stop right there. This is the oldest trick in the Bible, and the devil's been playing it on people for far too long, and there are people in this sanctuary that are being played. 
You think back to grandma's death, you think back to grandpa's death, your dad's death, you think back to a loved one's death, maybe a, a spouse's death, a child's death, and it is unbelievably gripping. You sit and wonder, oh, were they saved? Am I going to be saved? Will I see them in heaven? And the devil just plays it like a broken record over and over and over again. And I want you to hear what the Word of God says, my brothers and sisters. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54, it says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? My dear friends, in Christ, death has no hold over you. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to fear. You don't have to sit and think, Oh, am I going to be okay? Was my loved one okay? In Christ, we can rest that he has done it for them. I can't save them. Only Jesus saves them. We give our loved ones to God. We give ourselves to God, and we let him do the rest. Amen? Amen. Have you ever lived in that fear of death before? Because if you have, the today is the day where God says, give me that fear of death. I'm not going to let you go on like this anymore. Let Jesus be your example. He had to endure it in order to overcome it. And we too will one day endure death. But when we go into death, we're going to go into death clapping our hands, joyful to God, knowing that the death that, that the devil has tried to bring us under fear is really going to bring us into victory because the second death was taken at the cross by Christ himself. We are free in Christ, amen. We know that God is doing a work in us now through his word so that we can walk in victory, declaring the victory to people who walk in the, in the heaviness of life. You see... Because of Christ, we will overcome death too. We no longer need to live in fear. We do no longer need to live in silence or quietness with the veneer. We do no longer need to, to put up the false facades. We can pull back the curtains and say, I know who I am in Christ. I am a saved child of God, a loved child of God. The old Sean is gone. The new Sean is here. And my opportunity is to love you no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. This is God's call on our lives to love one another and to love God. And one day death will be completely destroyed and gone for all of eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says this, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Notice the Bible says that death will be destroyed. Not just defeated. Destroyed. Destroyed means gone, obliterated. No more. No more existence. That will be a wonderful day, my brothers and sisters. We will never have to think or worry about that. Jesus Jesus is alive he is risen God is recreating the world through him and God wants to recreate you now just say I believe Jesus sees he sees you he sees you right now he sees you and he calls you by name there is nothing to fear anymore my friends he sees everything don't worry about hiding it he has seen it and he still loves you and there's nothing to fear not even death let go of your sin give it to Jesus let go of your shame. Give it to Jesus. For sin and shame will not enslave you any longer in the name of Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit releases you. Death has been defeated. And new life is yours. Receive it. In John chapter 8, verse 36, read it with me, church. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I want you to just, in this quiet moment, let's just pray a little bit quieter, team. Let's just bring her down. 
Switchboard, bring her down. Chase, quieter. In this very holy moment, I want you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes. And I want you to go to the most beautiful garden you have ever seen in your life. Say amen if you're there. Amen. amen. Keep your eyes closed because it's just you in this most beautiful garden. And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to picture the risen Jesus standing in front of you in this garden. Now I want you to acknowledge that Jesus sees you just as you are. I want you to acknowledge that he sees everything about you. He sees your hurts. He sees your hopes. He sees your disappointments. He sees your sin. He sees all of the rough edges. And he loves you. He loves you very deeply. Now keep looking right into the eyes of Christ. I want you to imagine Jesus. He's looking at you and he says, your name. And then Jesus says to you, I want to recreate you and give you new life. In the quietness of this holy resurrection Sunday morning, I want you to respond to Jesus as you're looking at him right now, hearing his words. I want to recreate you and give you new life. Whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or you're just coming to know him today, you just talk to him. Pray to him. He loves you. This is God's holy and powerful word. Let us stand and respond to this word of God as we conclude this Resurrection Sunday. As we sing out to the Lord, may you be blessed as we respond and give thanks to God for the resurrection power that now lives in you. Let's stand and respond to God. Victory, what 
praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. Our praise will rise to Christ our King. Yes. The fear that held us now gives way to Him who is our is now alive in me oh your name your name is victory the oh, praise will rise to christ our king your name your name is victory
expecting another boring resurrection Sunday that you've never really understood but today something has come alive in you today his spirit has woke you up to something that's unbelievable and if that's you today if God has poured life into you and you have found yourself believing that God you are real. And I believe that you live in me now. And I'm going to encourage you to just soak it in and say, I believe, I thank you, God. Would you find someone that you know that loves Jesus and tell them? Just find someone. Say, Easter morning at Victory, something profound happened to me. The Spirit of God spoke to me in ways that I never believed could do it. And this is the portion of the service where God puts His word of blessing and benediction on the spoken word, the sung word, the read word, as God has been speaking to you today. First we read in the book of Jude 24, to Him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you before His glorious presence in heaven with the recreation hope of the resurrection. He will bring you before Father God without fault and with great joy. And it is only to God our Savior to be all glory, all majesty, all power, all authority. For it is only through Jesus our Lord who is before all ages now and forevermore, that he sends you from this place with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ upon you, with the love of God flowing in and through you, with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uniting you in purpose and aim with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you have trusted in him on this Resurrection Sunday so that you may overflow with the power of the Holy Spirit. And today he seals that blessing in his holy name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Go with this hope, with this resurrection hope, for this is your gift from God. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, for you families that want to have a special day, I want you to take a picture up here. Be blessed as we sing this beautiful doxology. Know this, the Savior who met you in the last hour is going with you. He's changing your life from this day on forevermore. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Happy Easter, everybody. We're so blessed to be here to worship together. Be blessed. Spend some good time with family. And for those watching online, God bless you all. We'll see you next Sunday.